Okay. So um, today we want to have a conversation about uh, equity minded teaching in the classroom, but, uh, or, and we also want to um, focus on the topics that we've been mulling over as a group. And so these were um, course design and students experiences with, with course design um, in terms of navigation, um, retention, and how do we, um, um, you know, encourage students to stick with a class and kind of intervene. Um, and then the last one was dynamic lecturing. And so what are we doing with content? How are we making that content entering, interesting to interact with? Um, all that stuff. And I really feel like those are practical applications of this sort of larger kind of pedagogical um, framework the, uh, of equity minded teaching. So I'm hoping we'll start my plan is to start with that kind of frame, um, define it and kind of chat about it a little bit. Um, 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 and then uh, we'll kind of go through uh, Luke Wood's um, practical sort of applications, the be intrusive, be relevant, be race conscious, uh, uh, be community centric and be relational. And I'm hoping that we'll get into that kind of course design communication and then dynamic assignments. Okay. So um, I pulled two quotes, one from the Center for Urban Education's uh, Equity Minded webpage. Um, I, I attended this institute with, with several colleagues from Maricosta at, at the beginning of summer, um, which is really where I'm kind of, where my understanding of equity is really grounded, was within that experience. And then I pulled another quote from um, Luke Wood's uh, keynote to the uh, online teaching conference. So I'll just go through it and I'd, I'd love to hear from, from you know, um, Shelly, Jade, and Jim, just kind of how you're thinking about this stuff and what you would add and, and that, that kind of thing. So um, from the Center for Urban Education, uh, they define equity mindedness as a perspective or mode of thinking exhibited by practitioners who call attention to patterns of inequity in student outcomes. And that's really observed in data. There's a real emphasis on data collection. Um, these practitioners are willing to take personal and institutional responsibility for the success of their students and critically reassess their own practices. It also requires that practitioners are race conscious and aware of the social and historic context of exclusionary practices in American higher education. Okay. Um, so do we want to, can we respond to those ideas and, and sort of how you're thinking of that or what you would add to that or um, questions you might have? Um, I can facilitate this. <laughs> Jay, do you want to jump in? <laughs> oh, thanks, Curry. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> um, well, I think uh, when we're having discussions of equity, oftentimes it defaults to a very surface level um, definition of diversity. Mm -hmm. So I think when it says that it also requires that practitioners are race, race conscious, which is also what Dr. Wood brings up, that it's not just about um, offering a picture or reading by a certain author and saying, oh, my equity box is checked off, but really responding to um, students' needs in terms of their ability to voice themselves, which I was frankly quite nervous about in an online forum because I was like, oh man, they're going to run willy-nilly and it's going to be all out of control and we're going to have to moderate like Twitter. Um, but I think it is actually in a way, a lot safer space for students, especially, and I know we've talked about this before, our students are not just students of color, but they're working. I have a lot of students who are deployed right now. Um, so there's students who might not feel like they have a particular place to share those things. So it's almost like the online becomes a safer space for them to feel heard and validated. Um, I think one of the tricky things is for me in teaching online is that all of that validation on my part and from their classmates part comes through writing. And so there are certain presumptions about their ability or their comfort in doing so. Um, so I, I get nervous too, because English is not my first language. So I reread the sentences like 8 million times just to make sure it's clear. This semester I've been trying to simplify and like use graphics to explain things. Um, and that's why I really liked in your class, Curry, that you had quizzes on the announcements to help ensure that students are reading and that they know what to read and how to go about a class because we can't assume that 
if I send out an announcement, everyone's going to read it or know how to highlight it, even if I boldface it or bullet point it. Um, so I think those are things that come up with equity. It's not just, you know, the color of the skin, but it's about all the background with education that comes with that. Um, like how you interact with the written word, what language, lang what language it's in, um, how it comes across to you, and just the general access to the technology too. Cool. Thank you, Jade. That's awesome. I'm writing down all your, all these ideas, and we'll kind of I think collect them in a moment. Um, Sh Shelley, do you want to respond? Uh, your site, you're muted. Hold on. My, I'll unmute you. I got gotcha. you. I think. No, I'm not going to be able to do it. Yeah, there we go. You're good. Go for <laughs> it. To myself. Uh, <laughs> so I guess like the examples he was talking about, it came up in the discussion board and I really like the discussion board and use it a lot. And my students do reflect on it. There's some, it's their favorite thing they do in class and others are like, they don't understand why their time is invested there. So it's interesting to see the students' responses to it. But I have a lot of, I guess like second language, but international but technically not international students they come from all over the place like moved to america from like eastern europe and um south america i have a very big range and so whatever the topic is that we're working on they're bringing an entirely different perspective um especially like with 202 focusing on the united states and like war culture um what sort of the artifacts we're looking at mean to them and and keeping in mind like the microaggressions and things like that, the students are very careful on how they state stuff. So it's not like an issue that I've had to address um, because they tend to be extremely respectful of one another and like overly aware of how they're presenting their perspectives. So I don't know. Yeah, I think that is really interesting The just, it, it's common in my online classes that I have students that are either international students or students who are traveling or students who are sort of in transition living on the East Coast, but they're planning to come back to Oceanside um, um, or they're abroad, like they're in the middle of I'm going back home or, or for whatever reason. Um, so there's, there's so many opportunities for, for that kind of, uh, you know, to express a local understanding and, and, and sort of a, a present sort of a presence in different situations that really add to that diversity. So I think that's really interesting. And just in terms of content and discussion. Um, I, to I totally agree with Shelly. Like I was surprised how respectful students are online that they're so supportive of each other, even more so sometimes than on ground classes. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like some of the students feel so isolated that they're they're happy to reach out and be like, hey, that was a great point. You wrote about being a single mom and I hate my kids too. I love you, you know? <laughs> totally. <laughs> find all these connections. So yeah. I totally agree with that, that I think we're kind of set up as online educators to be wary of, oh no, the online space, they're just gonna trash each other. But it's actually quite uh, reassuring to see how they, they uh, support each other. Yeah. Jim, you wanna jump in on that? Oh, uh, let me see. Do I need to turn my mic on? No, you're good. You're good. Okay. I, um, no, I, I, I agree with that. But I think that that is sort of the challenge is that uh, the, I, I like how Jade used that, that word isolation. I think that that is something that can happen to our students both uh, in face-to-face -face and online settings. And I think it's one of the challenging things I'm, I'm always looking for ideas on, how, how to feel more connected to each other. Uh, so I, I think that's a really interesting idea. Yeah. Uh, and I definitely, I want to come back to that idea. Um, when we, There's two, I think, categories that are going to address that, what the intrusive sort of practices we have, how do we interrupt that isolation, and then this community-centric, you know, what are we doing in our courses to design experiences that draw students into, into a community? So let's, um, so let's, uh, uh, I've jotted that down, so we'll, maybe that's where we'll come back to uh, in just a moment. Um, since that's where we're already thinking. But I want to also sort of introduce this notion because this is also something that I feel like equity mindedness really addresses. This, uh, what, what Luke Wood says, he says, we teach in general as educators how we were taught. We, uh, uh, when we are considering how to structure an online learning environment for most of our underserved students, we often do so by ignoring the fact that that's 
how we engage our practice. In other words, most professors were never directly taught how to teach. And so when we go to teach online, we kind of revert back to these sort of how we were taught um, um, experiences. And so I think two things about that are true. One, I think that's really the power of this um, sort of community of practice that's really wanting to take responsibility for, you know, historical structures uh, within higher education that have been exclusionary, um, number one. And so there's this sort of purposed disruption of how we were taught to try to teach more effectively to underserved students. Um, but then two, the online space is really a rich environment for this because while some of us were taught in online courses, that experience was somewhat rudimentary, right? And, and we're not really wanting to teach like we were taught in the online experience. At least I, I don't. <laughs> so I wonder, so again, I wonder if, we, if there's anything we want to add to that before we get into kind of the applications of these ideas. We don't have to go in order. You can just jump in if you want to. <laughs> Um, I, I guess my knee-jerk reaction is, of course, I don't want to teach the way that I was taught, which was super didactic, super canonical stuff, very, uh, you know, unidirectional, um, and I don't do that at all in the on-ground, um, but it's funny because when I was preparing to teach online, I was really talking to my students about the other on online courses that they take. And so having to look at other disciplines and how they function online, it kind of reinforced that some of the students, at least those who are choosing to take online classes, also find comfort in some of that more didactic strategy, I guess. Um, one of the things they said is they, they love a PowerPoint to guide. And I was like, I'm not doing PowerPoint. That's so 1999. <laughs> um, but they really like this one core text where you're kind of giving them information to keep them on track and then whatever interactive stuff is kind of a branch from the trunk of that tree. So um, I was kind of conflicted about that. Like I, I wanted to do all this different kind of interactive stuff, but the students feedback was really, no, we want this. We need you at the core and then you can play with this other stuff there. So it's kind of like having to mix what I had experienced and resisted against with what I do now. That's really interesting. Cool. Celia or Jim, do you want to respond to that? Well, I don't think it's a coincidence that the, the teacher of the year at Miracosta and most other colleges is almost always a lecturer. Hmm. I mean, it happens again and again. Hmm. And I think that's because that that is perceived as a comfort zone. And um, so that means that some of the practices we want to try to do here are going to be counterintuitive for everybody. Mm -hmm. So and, and that, that adds to the challenge, but also kind of to the fun of the hunt, right? The fun of the game. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, Shelly, do you want to do you want to add to that? Because I think this kind of well, yeah, so, yeah. Go ahead. Well, I mean, I guess I have a similar experience, even like in on-ground classes, that students have this strange love of PowerPoints. Like it, they get very excited. And I think I have maybe two that I use like in my on-ground classes. Um, and they want to know, is it going to be like uploaded? Are they going to have access to it? And it's just like the PowerPoint wasn't that important, but to them it means something very specific. Um, but for my online class, when I do the videos, a lot of times, I put together like a PowerPoint and like move through it um, and I'll have links and be more interactive, but as a way to structure the information to keep me from clicking all over the place. But yes. um, right. yeah. Yep. Hey Curry, are we yeah. supposed to have access to this Google doc? Well, I wasn't going to let you, but I can if you want to. No. <laughs> I just don't know if you wanted us to have access to it. I'm fine with just looking at it. Yeah, so I was thinking I would type while you talk. Otherwise, we all would be tempted to type and none of us would talk or cool. few of us would talk. So I love this. So I, I do want to start here because I think this is, this is interesting. Uh, this is my experience as well. In the classroom, I think there's an assumption about that space and the structures of that space that I can immediately start to disrupt right, by arranging the, the desks instead of rows, I put them in little spheres or circles or triangles or whatever we want to do that day. I'll stand in the middle of the room, which forces everyone to look at each other, all that stuff. And I think students go with that because they're already sort of familiar in that space, they're comfortable there. And so I can, when I disrupt it, uh, they'll follow me, right? Uh, if I immediately start to disrupt 
uh, the online space, everyone's totally unmoored because they're not used to that space, especially because my course experience is going to be different than Jim's and different than Jade's and different than Shelley's. So there is this weird, like almost contradiction. Like you have to provide the guidance, the PowerPoint, the what we want to resist in the on site space. We have to provide that structure and get and allow them to feel confident before we can then provoke them into sort of these unique experiences, these interactive experiences. So how, how do we see that as addressing equity? How, how might, so what is it about the structured space and then the need to sort of branch from that structured space? How is that addressing equity? What do we think? Well, maybe this is like not answering that question. It's the opposite thing that I'm about to say. Um, Cause I know last week there was a discussion of like making assignments optional and having all these like optional materials to help students and support them if they need it type thing. Um, but my class doesn't have any of that. Like it's a little bit more bare bones, but like everything I put there is required. And I know that was something that Dr. Wood talked about in this idea of when it's optional students tend not to use it because they feel it's not important or else it'd be required. Yep. Um, so even though there isn't necessarily a quiz attached to all my videos or like whatever material it is, it's there and it's set up as required and I like refer back to it in other points during the week um, to really like encourage that use of it as a required use and not an optional um, in an attempt to get like all the students sort of like the same information and like baseline for support to start with. Yep. Yeah. Right, so optional assignments as sort of these interactive experiences um, where required assignments might be more this sort of tree trunk, right? This sort of the, the essential guidance, okay. I think um, one of the things that comes to mind uh, just in how, how to design the course and structure things that it, so that it's navigable for students, um, one thing that is so helpful is, is doing all these videos, um, not only at the beginning of the semester, but at the beginning of each module to kind of, uh, like what Shelly was saying, just kind of go through things with them. Um, but then I add little stories in, because um, I think that with equity-minded education, especially with online stuff where you're their first and sometimes only um, interaction point is this instructor positionality. So. I think instructor positionality is really important in offering those students videos because they can hear your voice, they can see and understand why you structured things the way that you did, why you chose the text. So it's almost like a meta commentary on what they see on their screen. Um, so if they can kind of get into my head, then they're, it seems like they can understand it better and they can respond to it with, with what they need. Um, and I think uh, in setting up some of their their first week's activities is like I use the Padlet this semester for their introductions and the <laughs> the outpouring of stories and comments on each other's videos that they uploaded I noticed definitely increased the amount of stuff that they were writing in the weeks following but also the quality of the things that they are sharing so me putting my positionality out there encourage them to reciprocate um, that kind of depth, I guess, not that I'm deep, but that they came back with all this depth um, and their voices were really shining through. So I think it's just being that vulnerable person up front so that their vulnerability and their voice comes out. Um, so even like a simple platform like Padlet just opened up all these other stories. Okay, so I want you to share that. <laughs> I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Can we, can we look at it and kind of dig into it? Yeah. Uh -huh. Awesome. Sweet. Um, okay, share. Can you see that? Yes. Okay. So yeah, for the first week, um, and the way that I introduce it, I've done this in the on-ground classes for a couple years because I just find that it's the most useful. I, I show them this Inigo Montoya clip, sure. which nicely ages me because they're like, what's the princess bride? And I'm like, oh my God, we're <laughs> four. <laughs> um, but I show them that because even if they have no familiarity with the movie, they can recite the three lines after they've seen this one minute clip. So they understand 
this idea of credibility, of being specific, of making an impression, of characterization, of all these things that we end up delving into in the later weeks. Um, so I show them that as a model, and then I start out by sharing my video, which is way down here. So I have one down here um, that introduces myself. I think this semester I did something about, um, it was just about my desk. Like, there's a picture of my grandma here. I talked about a Childish Gambino song that was playing while I was typing to them. And then I had some other dumb thing. But um, just by giving them, uh, like, a snapshot of my desk, they were able to share all these family photos. Um, a lot of them talked about um, their military service or their immigration, um, their family photos. Like, so for this one, I remember she talked about her mom and then this turned into an essay that they just turned in about her mom being absent and learning to become a woman in the absence of womanhood. And so all of this stuff that came out of these opening videos kind of snowballed into paper topics later. Um, and so one of the other things that I use this for is for them to respond to each other's paper ideas so that they throw up a few ideas and then their students, their classmates respond to it so that they feel like kind of communal in developing their paper topics and they totally have control over that. Um, so I don't know, I don't know what it is, but just like this layout and having them do their videos like I do videos for them just brought out all of this stuff. When Maria was observing, she was like, girl, you got some deep shit on there. <laughs> like people are sharing like their innermost secrets. And I was I was very surprised. Um, and then I also I use um, previous students essays that I feel were very successful as they're reading. So it's not like I'm doing canonical top down stuff, but I'm using stuff that students have created to say like this is possible this is what comes out these are your peers this is who you can connect to and find inspiration from it's not from you know a, a reader or something something by joan didion or whoever the hell you know yeah what class is this for this is a 100 class how do you prompt the feedback what's the what's the instruction or the the call for feedback how is it framed um, it kind of varies like so for this introductory one it was totally open just you know respond to someone you had a connection with or who who made you remember what they said like had, had a really memorable introduction when they vote on paper topics I tell them um, write us uh, write two sentences that explain to your partner uh, what is the topic that you want to hear the story behind and why something like that so for everything it's it's a little bit different um, I like to frame it as like which of your peers taught you something memorable um, so that they're always feeling like they're teaching each other more than I am. Because even when I do videos, I'm like, this is so stupid. <laughs> but they come up with the cool stuff. So I want them to focus on each other rather totally. than uh, totally. what I bring up. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> cool. So I feel like this fits perfect in that community centric, right? Um, especially because it's open, um, um, students get to represent themselves on their own terms using language that they would use without, without any kind of expectation or sort of directive to use a certain kind of language or to limit that language or adjust that language. Um, and then the pictures, I was going to ask you this also, the pictures that you invite them to share, the, those are kind of basically like just represent yourself kind of thing because you chose a picture of your desk. Oh, yeah. And I don't even tell them that they need to share pictures. Okay. Because you model it. Got they, it. Yeah. I modeled it, but I say that, you know, you can show anything, really. It doesn't have to be anything personal, but I think what came out was a lot of personal stuff. Yeah. Um, because, like, with Inigo Montoya, those three sentences have to really encapsulate who you are and ah, set you apart from everyone else. So yeah. they chose things that nobody else could ever say. Right. Um, so the, the pictures kind of came out. And I think that a lot of students just kind of live in that, that world of all the images anyway. Yeah. Um, so oh, yeah. Totally. natural to them. Mm -hmm. So this frame of my name is, and then you killed my. <laughs> yeah. I, I do tell them, please don't start your sentence with you killed. <laughs> by. <laughs> Yeah. But you're right. I mean, that, that, that is such a memorable moment and, and such a sort of like, you know, that, that movie uh, 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 
postmodern, all those things. But like, it's a serious fra- like phrasing of who he is and what he's about. I mean, it's his whole life, right? So it really does set this project up for share some deep shit. <laughs> yeah, I, and I think last semester I talked about why he starts with his name, like what that means for family pride and your cultural background. Yeah, so right. people right. started sharing the stories behind their name because I shared mm-hmm. mine and. I mean, this is really interesting stuff. People are just interesting. I like, I have a cold black heart inside, but when I hear their stories, I'm like, oh, <laughs> people are good. I, it's okay. I'm going to stay. <laughs> I wrote that down on my notes. I have a cold black heart. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Okay. That's great. So, um, Let's see. So we were also talking about isolation. So how do we interrupt isolated experiences? How are we designing our courses so students are constantly finding opportunities to um, um, sort of find themselves in community rather than in isolation? Um, Shelly or Jim, do you want to do want to jump on that one? Well, I you know I'm, I'm I read uh, Dr. Wood's book a couple of years ago. Um, teaching men of color and a lot of the a lot of the presentation that we watched takes ideas from that and I, I know we're talking about course design but part of it to me and what I find compelling in his argument is that some of this is just hard-ass work like it's not actually structuring your course it's actually taking the time to individually track down a student who seems disconnected Maybe they didn't show up to a class. Maybe they fell behind on an activity. Maybe their posts have become cursory. And then, you know, he's got these things that he talks about and he uses similar language in the video. You know, it's uh, avoid the approach me first and prove your first stand, prove yourself first stances. Check in frequently with students. Avoid simply directing students to support resources. A lot of these things aren't about how you set up your course. It's how you interact with your students as human beings and how you intervene when they seem to start to struggle. And um, that's really challenging to me in our Miracosta setting because we've set ourselves up where I, I don't always know that we have enough time to, to be as present in our courses as we want to be. And, and, and so that seems to me about more than just how we structure our course, but sort of how we're orienting ourselves personally towards our students and the, and the hard work that that requires. And also the experience of sort of failure. You know, you'll try with a student three or four times and they'll kind of ignore you. But then if you stop because of that, there'll be that student you miss who was just waiting for you to reach out or that student who was just waiting for you to reach out for the fifth time <laughs> and then was going to finally respond. So I'm just thinking a lot about that other piece, that sort of hard work of grinding out the, the intervention. Yeah. Shelly, are you experiencing that at all in your class this semester where you're, you're needing to really reach out to students and are you having those kinds of, you know, where it takes a lot of communication and, and, and it's either successful or it's not? No. I haven't had that. Um, uh, that's good. <laughs> well, because students students like to send me notes all the time. Um, so they're like reaching out when they have problems and like before I can even awesome. reach out to them. Yeah. And so good. like a student didn't submit their work last week and she like immediately emailed me like Thursday at midnight and she's like, this is what happens. That's awesome. And yeah, so they're very, they've been very vocal about that at the start of the semester I had one or two and I emailed them and since then I guess that's made them um contact me first I guess instead of me finding them cool so that's great yeah that is awesome yeah um I'll say that that's one of the benefits of my quiz scheme is it forces students, I make those quizzes custom every single weekend and I'm really f- responding to what's happened the week before. I'm featuring students' posts. Um, so I, I feel like that's part of regular effective contact in my course, even though it's a recorded video um, and I'm speaking to the whole class. But the great thing is, is by default, if the student misses the quiz due date, um, the whole week's content is locked to them. So they have to email me to say, please unlock the quiz, you know. Uh, And I love that because then I go, sweet, how's it going? You know, I just want to make sure everything's fine. And it just, it creates that, that, that opportunity to communicate. Um, So it's like, it's like a twofer. Um, 
I, I wanted to share one thing really quickly, and, and, and I want to bring this back to, you know, the, the, the emphasis on race consciousness, um, which I think is particularly challenging in the online space, especially because I don't require that my students post pictures. I'm not always uh, uh, aware of students' ethnicity or with whom they, uh, what communities they identify. Um, and so being race conscious in an online class, uh, um, I think can be difficult, it can be challenging. Um, but I, I, when I know a student um, uh, um, um, is uh, either traditionally underserved or not feeling super confident in the classroom um, um, for, for, for these sort of reasons of a historical structure, right? A, 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 a how we were taught model. Um, and they're kind of bringing that expectation to my class. I really do try to target those students. And so I wanted to share, um, this is something I, uh, uh, I do like week three. So week one is all about get get to know the course week two we have our first real discussion and that's really what the focus on the writing is and i don't tell them like structure your sentences correctly or cite your sources it's just you know be thoughtful use examples from the reading and really you know develop your response so i'm just trying to kind of help set up that kind of emphasis on what a strong discussion is going to look like in week three we start talking about paper development. So we start talking about thesis statements and paragraph support, et cetera. But what I do to set that up in week three is I go back to that discussion they had in week two and I use their, their discussions to say, you're already doing all this stuff that we're talking about with paragraphs. You already have evidence, you already have transitions, you already have topic sentences. And so I try to pick four students during that week three and this is the lecture for that week. It's just me talking about their writing and drawing connections to structural elements in, in, in essays. Um, and what I try, so, so this is the race conscious uh, 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 element. I try to make sure I'm choosing students of color I'm trying to make sure I choose uh, uh, students that represent sort of a spectrum of gender in my class. Um, and, and I try to choose essays that are um, strong or, or examples that are strong, but like not perfect, not intimidatingly like the best, right? And so I just, and so this is what it looks like to a student. I've highlighted their writing. I always start on the discussion board so you can see their name and their picture, whatever it was they chose. Uh, and then in the corner you see me doing things like this and I'm always like your writing is amazing right and it's I don't know how effective that is but I can't help it <laughs> but what I wanted to share with you is um, students in my class have to keep a journal right um, a, a reading journal and they have to respond to all the lectures and a certain uh, portion of the readings and so I'm able to in weeks after kind of look at this data basically of what students thought about you know this particular lecture um, it's neat because I can, I can see the whole class responding to a student's work and that's one sort of, you know, uh, uh, point of information that's helpful for me. But I love looking at the students for, who's, uh, uh, for whom I chose, you know, featured their, their writing. So this was the first student. Um, this is a Latinx student who, uh, who's actually struggling with um, uh, food securities. He's homeless right now. He's a single father, uh, a single parent father of a, of a, of a three-year-old uh, daughter. Um, at the beginning, I didn't think he was going to make it, like was turning in stuff late, was really stressed out. Um, and so I picked his post on purpose because I wanted him to have this connection to the class, right? I wanted him to be featured as this, right, example of, of not just heading in the right direction, but really exceptional work. Um, and so this was his response. And, and you can just see in the reaction that it was, it was really powerful for him, right? Um, he was immediately emotionally invested. Um, he felt affirmed. Um, and I think this was a critical moment where he was about to sort of just give up and, and do what he had to do, where this, this sort of really, you know, he became part of the class and he had a reason to stay um, because, because of this uh, uh, um, experience. Um, the other students had similar reactions. I like this student. This is a student who didn't really address the fact that I chose his post just was like, here's the main ideas. This is a very like to the point student. Um, but at the end had this sort of, you know, <laughs> riff on it a bit and jam out. I like that as a, as a response. Um, and then the other, so the other two students that were featured also acknowledged that this was, this was a positive experience for them. They start to also sort of, you know, kind of note what they're learning about structure. Um, so, so both things are happening, right? Um, 
but I, I'm really pleased with how this, this works in my class. And I feel like it, it's both intrusive, right? And, as, and also that kind of community oriented piece. So where, where are you sharing this? Like, I mean, I guess at what point and how in the class does this happen? Yeah, so this is a, um, a lecture that um, every week starts with a lecture. It's like a reading or it's a video. Um, um, and it, it frames what we're going to do throughout that whole week. So this is during week three. And it's featured here. So they have this first one where I'm saying, this is what a thesis is, this is what paragraphs do, um, here's how I'd like you to think about them in this class. And then I say, but this is only the first part, right? This is part one of that lecture. The more important part uh, is part two, um, which uh, uh, features, you know, writing of students in the class currently. Curry, this is a dumb question, but you create the quiz through Canvas, right? It's a Canvas function, the quizzes you create? Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. Oops, sorry. Yep. So, I think it's, so I, I also want to touch back on uh, what, what was shared earlier about just the the, the respectful sort of the, 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 the respectful forum of an online class, it, the fear is that it will turn into Twitter, but I rarely, I, I've never seen that happen actually in my online class. Um, and, and I think that's really interesting. I think, I wonder if there's an assumption, I don't, I haven't read anything about this, but on the behalf of a student that the online, like because it's a class, right? It's an English class that what we're going to share in this space, we can get into critical ideas. And I know that, that, I've been in, in online classes before where as a student, the conversation has got a little bit aggressive. Um, but I don't know, I, I, like there's, I guess maybe it's, it's all of us are just framing the course as community oriented and so that's what we get. I don't know, what, what, what do we think about this? Well, one thing in my experience when I was a student in a course where the discussion got aggressive is the instructor wasn't really present in the course. So there was no sort of structure or monitoring of any discussions that took place yeah. and I feel like that could possibly have something to do with it but no I think that's yeah I think you're right I think that's super important and I have like a little netiquette statement on my syllabus about how to how we behave in the online space um, that like encourages that critical thinking and disagreement, but focusing on ideas as opposed to attacking other people, but. Yeah. I have an etiquette policy too. Um, it's the etiquette policy. It's basically my civility and respect policy, which I use in every class, not just my online class. Um, it, it, I haven't rewritten it with, you know, um, these principles in mind. Um, I wonder, Jay, do you, do you address, um, these issues, race, uh, uh, ethnicity, diversity, specifically in any kind of netiquette policy in your class? Uh, yeah, I do. My netiquette policy addresses it directly and it's coupled with a picture of Samuel L. Jackson from Pulp Fiction saying, be cool. I took out the motherfucker part, but you know, they, <laughs> they kind of get the idea because <laughs> everybody knows that reference. Yeah. But, um, you know, I, because my on-ground classes are so race-centric, especially in teaching MANA, where we address it directly all day, every day, and it's really the core of our curriculum, I felt a little ambivalent going into the online space just because of my own feelings about race and the way that students respond to me, especially if they're relying on a photo um, on Canvas to know who I am. So I make a conscious decision not to show my face in the videos that I make for them, that they can hear my voice and see what I'm showing them on my screen, but they're not responding to how I look. It's just because I feel like people have varied and kind of strange responses to that. Um, and so I, I think it, I'm just trying to, well, because Dr. Wood talks about social presence and keeping it real, but I think the flip side of that is 
this reductive view of authenticity that only certain people could talk about certain things. And so when I, in my video lectures, or when I talk about student work, whether it's current student work or previous students work, I want them to know that I am a reader and a writer who draws upon various different inspiration. So like in one of my lectures, I use Tupac and I talk about how I chose this picture of Tupac because he's smiling and he always gets portrayed as this, this gangbanger. Um, and then I have works from Asian American authors. This is like just work from everywhere and George Carlin of all people, you know, so it's this variety of things so that we can kind of see the ways that they intersect rather than like oh, I'm this Asian American voice, so I'm only gonna talk about this, or I can't talk about hip hop because I wear glasses or you know, whatever it is. Um, so I've just been trying to kind of experiment with that. And for me, it's a little bit liberating to not have the reactions to my gender or my race online. Um, but then I know it can be very empowering too, to um, you know, represent yourself and see yourself. So. I just kind of feel a little ambivalent about what Dr. Wood is saying about mirror artifacts because it's such a large responsibility on our part as an instructor and it's a reflection of the institution as well as the students. So I, I like it when they contribute what they think is important, um, but I don't want to always be the one putting my image up there or choosing images for them saying that this is some new alternative canon. Um, you know, so I just feel the weight of that a little bit and I'm trying to negotiate it every semester when I choose readings. I like that. So, so mirror artifacts, it's not that they're not important and they're not effective. It's, it's if, if a class is the origin of those artifacts, then you do have a more true and sort of authentic mirror uh, theme or, or montage, right? Mm -hmm. uh, class yeah. to class to class to class. Yeah, or I like to choose one that we have a response to immediately based on our assumptions, but then dig into the layers of what that really means and what the story is behind it so that we're not defaulting to that checklist of, okay, like all these ethnic groups were covered, so we're equitable or whatever. Yeah. Um, but just really seeing the depth of every single image, every single person and background and identity marker that there is. Because I think sometimes, um, you know, when you're trying to be equity minded, like people start focusing on one thing and then discarding others, like saying, oh, that's old or that's not inclusive or whatever. So I just kind of want to look at the intersections and see what people are actually saying. So I want people to focus not on what I look like, but what I'm saying about these works too. Yeah. Um, That's so interesting, especially with the way you start. You're like, it's how I modeled. It's how I shared. It's, and it provoked all of this really sort of, you know, authentic sharing of who we are. And then you're saying, but part of me, I'm keeping anonymous. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit like Banksy like that. I never show my face. <laughs> uh, I'm going to add that. And one thing that I found is really effective, especially going back to what we were saying earlier about the, the, the intrusive approach where students aren't submitting. I've been doing individualized videos for their their um, their work um, and I find that that helps them to submit more and on time because they feel like I'm directly talking to them but yeah. I never show my face in that video but somehow they're listening to me and they're getting it and their papers are improving so awesome that's kind of what I mean about being liberating it's not about me talking to them per se but they're just focusing on what I'm saying I have had a ton of success with the video feedback, even in my on-site mm -hmm. classes. Um, mm -hmm. Students, and I don't know if it's just this moment, um, but students are digging it. It's awesome. Cool. Cool. All right. So we've got about nine minutes left. Um, what else? What else are we thinking about? What else are we trying in our courses? Um, maybe where are we feeling challenged? How can we, how can we support each other in these last nine minutes? I guess the other thing I would say, or maybe just throw out there is, and, and this was implied earlier, that the online space really does lend itself to more contemplative experiences. Um, I think in my, my on-site class, there's the, we have the rich discussions and I create quiet space. Like we'll have silence where I'm not, I'm not worried about it feeling awkward. 
I'm, I'm seeing eyeballs light up. And so we have moments to think, but I think the online space, especially when, depending on how you structure your deadlines, there's an opportunity to dip in, mull things over as you go throughout the week, sit with your own ideas as you articulate them in a discussion post, read others. Um, so where, I guess, if, if that's an advantage of online instruction, um, where does that really sort of become something impactful given these practices? So intrusiveness, relevance, race consciousness, community centric, uh, relational, or something else? What, what else about that kind of, you know, that nature of the online class that we can contemplate more, maybe more often than we can um, on site? Well, I think maybe part of it has to do with like pacing, because even though it isn't like a self-paced class, um, when you're like on site and those moments of silence and waiting for things to click with students and them to move places, whereas like online they can like encounter the material and then leave it and then come back to it before they actually have to respond and who knows whether, like how much time they maybe take with it like percolating in the back of their minds before engaging with it. Mm -hmm. um, which I think can give them like more space to learn the way they learn, mm -hmm. right? And sort of open up that like individually for each student. So maybe that would fit here. So just a relevance, like a personal relevance, um, um, a, a preferred learning style. Right. Um, cool, okay, so pacing content, cool. I think just building on that, that they can pull topics for the papers from wherever they are in life. I mean, geographically, temporally, spatially, all that stuff. Yeah. I have a student who is a military spouse and they're stationed in Okinawa right now. So her last paper was talking about the constraints of budgeting and a foreign budget <laughs> um, in Okinawa because you have this whole you know, military industrial complex and colonialism pricing mangoes at $80 a pop over there. And so she was talking about what that means for her living over there, um, trying to feed her kids um, and also be a student while her husband works and is deployed and is away all the time. So it's kind of nice, like what Shelly was saying about the pacing is that you can give them this framework and the assignment and then they can delve into their own lives and create a much richer conversation with the assignment, better than any prompt I could write. So leaving the prompt open. Um, and I really pulled from Violetta's prompt um, presentation from last year of keeping the prompts pretty open um, and letting the students be creative because they come back with better stuff than I could narrow down on in the question. Cool. Awesome. Um, the other thing that I want to, uh, that struck me, Jade, you were, you were, when uh, you were describing your course earlier, the kind of, you know, the, the initial orientating materials, the, here's my course, here's what's important, here's what's required, here's how you navigate, um, you, you s phrased it as like, almost like a story. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a narrative. Yeah, and I, I hadn't thought of that before, but I think that's, as, 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 so in other words, don't create a tour of your class, create a story about how your class should be experienced. I think, mm -hmm. right, positions us to have that more personal, conversational sort of uh, um, communication with our students. And you know what's been really helpful for me in that? Um, I was on the child development hiring committee last year. Mm -hmm. And because so much of their coursework is online, all the candidates had to walk us through an online course for 10 minutes 
and that was so illuminating for me because they essentially had to narrativize yeah. their entire class, not just yeah. the structure and the technical nuts and bolts of the design, but the course of the semester. So in seeing that arc, I was able to further conceptualize my own. So I think, you know, with this online education, when we're talking about equity across campus, it can be really fruitful to have interdisciplinary collaboration. Um, especially for our discipline because we're so malleable like we can do so many elastic things online so seeing what other disciplines are doing it was really really informative to me so that was very helpful that's awesome okay uh that needs to go somewhere interdisciplinary experiences with online courses <laughs> yeah. uh, maybe i'll just put it in every box yeah <laughs> perfect all right was there any any other uh observations or questions last two minutes cool well I really appreciate Jim Shelley Jade for hanging out um, I'm gonna uh, so I recorded this session I'm gonna post it on our blog um, and I think what I'll do is I'll also send this document out to uh, us and then folks who couldn't attend and then see if if we can come in with just a few more um, observations. I think this is really important work, um, especially as a, de a department, as a program um, that we're, we're targeting um, equity issues and we're, we're, we're approaching it with this sort of measured, um, purposeful, um, um, you know, kind of thinking that, that I feel like we was shared in this, this forum. So this is good stuff. Thank you, everybody. Um, hope you have a, a wonderful week nine. Um, happy grading. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Perfect. All right. Bye. See you guys.